Dale, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another one of Caribbean Chemicals Zoom training session. I'm Dale Smith. I'll be your presenter this afternoon. I'm also the product development agronomist for the Northwestern region. Today, we'll be looking at worm strategy or Caribbean chemicals worm strategy. And uh, we will delve into the products we integrate in our strategy and how those products are positioned to effectively control worms slash caterpillars. And also we'll go through a, a quick breakdown on the different insect orders that we often confuse in Jamaica as worms. So let's start off first with getting an understanding of what truly are considered worms or as it relates to agronomy in Jamaica. So what do we really call worms? Well, scientifically, worms are bilateral animals. They have right and left sides of the body that are replicable. So it's a mirror image, so to speak. And they are typically cylindrical and they have no legs, no external limbs, and they usually have no eyes. So those, that, those insects would be classified as worms. However, as it relates to agronomic pests in Jamaica, we generally include three insect orders, coleopteras, diptera. Coleopteras are like beetles. So all the beetles we know are coleopteras. Diptera will be like flies and lepidoptera will be like butterflies and moths. So those are basically the three order, insect orders that have an agronomic effect and are therefore termed as agronomic pests as it relates to worms. However, there has to be a great distinction. A distinction needs to be placed between the orders because a lot of time, most of the times, the pests that we consider to be worms are truly those of the Lepidopteran order. So, so as not to really confuse or go much very deep into it, we just have a quick breakdown. So as I mentioned before, coleoptera are beetles and weevils, and they actually make up the largest insect order. And their larvae are called grubs. So a lot of us might have seen some C-shaped, white-bodied insects and call them worms, but they're actual grubs because if you look closely, they actually have external legs. Diptera, as I also mentioned, like flies, mosquitoes, and their larvae are called maggots, also much different from true worms, what worms are. Lepidoptera now, butterflies and moths, they make up the second largest order and their larva are called caterpillars. Now these caterpillars are essentially what we here in Jamaica consider as agronomic pests slash worms. So these are what we, these are the pests that we contend with when we speak about certain vegetables, cabbage, corns, callaloo, that we see moving and munching. They are, of the, are from the order Lepidoptera. And here I have a quick printout of a life cycle of both the Coleoptera and the Lepidoptera. As I mentioned, Coleoptera is a beetle, Lepidoptera is a moth. So we can see some so form of similarity in terms of the life cycle. However, there's a marked difference between 
appearance of the caterpillar in the lepidopteran and that of the larva in the collapse and the beetle. So we'll come back to this, but I just wanted to give you a quick view of what it really looks like. So we, when we reach further in our discussion, you are able to use this as a reference point. Here again, just so clear up the distinction. If you notice on the left, the colorptan larva has legs as the larva matures, you can see clearly legs appearing. And they are generally C-shaped. And as we mentioned before, we call them grubs. So a lot of times you might see these particular grubs in the soil, in the root zone of certain tree crops, papayas, or in a lot of detritus material, a lot of rotten material, wood, or a lot of trash. When you remove them or when you are digging, doing some form of manual plowing, you will see them as the soil is unearthed or turned or tilt. You can see, you can see some of these grow. On this side, we have also showing the prolex. This is another distinguishing feature of a lepidopteran versus a coleopteran. There are no, if you look at these, we call them true legs, pro legs. There, there, there are none of these are seen on the grub of a coleopteran. So again, when we refer to worms slash caterpillars in, a, in an agronomic pest manner, we are speaking about lepidopterans, trying to make it very clear. So we are concentrating on moths, butterflies as the pest, or their larva as being the pest. Now that we've cleared up, or somehow shed some light on the distinction between what worms truly are, we can now move on to formulate a strategy. And the CCJ strategy or the Caribbean chemical strategy is not one that was pulled out of a magic hat. It is just following some basic principles that we use to control any pest. So any successful strategy or insect pest control program has to base its foundation on preventing or disrupting the life cycle of the pest. So remember, we just looked on adult egg larva. This, the control strategy must break that pattern in order to be successful. The chemistries and methods used also must target the development stages of the pest. So in other words, we have to prevent the development of the different stages so that the pest cannot continue to thrive. And thirdly, the control tactics may include one or more pest stages. So we may have chemistries or methods that are able to control more or suppress more than one stage of the pest development cycle. Very important. Also, we look at the particular chemistries because a control program is not solely based on a chemical approach. So you've noted that I've also included an IPM factor to it. But our chemistries also need to be based on the biology or behavior of the pest, very important. Different pests feed in a different manner. And as such, the chemistries or pesticides that we employ in our strategy has to match the feeding habit or biology of the pest. So in this case, we're speaking about caterpillars slash worms, our chemistries have to match how they feed. We also have to look at their life cycle, as we've, we've mentioned before, 
and see which life cycle, which stage of that life cycle is the most damaging or the stage that has the most negative impact on the crop or to the farmer. So if we look on that of the moth or lepidopteran, we can see clearly that the most destructive stage is actually the larval stage, the caterpillar stage, where they feed on the plant material. And therefore, that is the stage that is most destructive. And therefore, the stage that a lot of the concentration or emphasis of the control should be focused on. Remember, the control strategy can take in, in its, its span one or more different stages of the pest life cycle. And as I also alluded to before, it is important to note that IPM, integrated pest management tactics, should also be included in a successful control strategy. And a chemical approach should actually be the final prong to that control strategy. So we want to include or we want to practice things like scout, field scout, scout in the field, monitoring the pest population, field sanitation, crop rotation, and then include a chemical application with all of these practices. And by carrying out all of these, we are ensuring to have a comprehensive con control strategy that can be replicated throughout different fields, throughout different crops, while at the same time, not sacrificing its efficacy. So it's very important that these other IPM practices be included with your chemical treatment of the caterpillar slash worms. Now, the products that we have highlighted in our control strategy are actually quite simple in terms of how they go about doing that. Caratrax, Indicarb, and Mimic. And these products, as I mentioned also before, have been selected based on how the pest feeds its life cycle and therefore will be seen as the most effective chemistries to break that life cycle. Now, Cartrax has an active ingredient, lambda cyalotrin, and this is a contact slash ingestion mode of action. That means when this particular product is sprayed on the plant or comes in contact with the pest, it is able to work. So that's why we have a contact. So if it directly, it can directly contact the pest or if the pest moves through an area of the plant that has been sprayed with the product. It's also effective that way. It's also effective if the pest consumes, ingests plant material that has been sprayed with the product. So based on how caterpillars feed, we know they have a bite mouth part, they munch their gormandizers, so they eat a lot. They spend all of that time in that particular stage eating, eating. So we call them gormandizers. So they ingest. So this particular chemistry has proven to be very effective based on their biology and life cycle. And this is effective at all stages. So it can kill adults if it comes in direct contact with them. The larval stage if they crawl through it or when they munch on the material. So you can see how wide reaching this particular chemistry is. In the carb is also another effective chemistry and the active ingredient there is indoxacarb. It also has a mode of action of ingestion. So this particular product, the pest slash the worm larva would 
ingest. When they ingest it, it starts to work that way and it works by disrupting the nervous system. An additional um, factor point to in the carb is that it has some form of ovicidal effect, means it can also control eggs in the life cycle, a very important feature for um, a pesticide or chemistry to have in the control, in this control strategy. Because if you are able to fully prevent the eggs from developing, you can clearly see how that can disrupt the whole life cycle of the pest and therefore be very effective, especially when used in conjunction or rotation with another of these products in this control strategy. Mimic is a very unique product in terms of its control of worms, caterpillars. Active ingredient is tebiophenocide. And this particular product is what we call an IGR, an insect growth regulator. What it actually does, it actually causes premature molting. Now, molting is actually a natural stage in which the pest goes through in its development from moving from one stage, larval stage, to the next. So this particular product causes premature molting. So before the pests would naturally be ready to move on to the next developmental stage, it forces the pest into that state so it therefore shuts down the digestive system and the pest actually starts out before moving on very effective in the way in which it controls it so oftentimes with mimic you may see larvae that have been contacted with this they, they have come in contact with the spray they have ingested plant material that have been treated with mimic but you are still seeing them moving however fear not not because you are seeing them moving mean they are still effectively eating. So what they do, it would shut down their digestive system. So although they are moving, they have effectively stopped feeding and it would only be a matter of days before they actually starve and die out. So the way in which this works is very unique. And as I mentioned before, you can always use these chemistries in rotation to improve the efficacy based on the pest pressure that you may have. So for example, in a case you might have, and I, I like to point out cabbage is, a, is one of those crops that farmers have a lot of problem with, with in terms of diamondback moth. So you may have a case where the pest pressure is very high and one chemistry in itself may not offer you that level of efficacy in terms of time frame. So you can always use these in rotation. You may have applied Caratrax in the first stage because you wanted to get control of the adults. So you, you had a lot of adult moths flying around the field, so you wanted something to knock that adult population quickly down. You applied some Caratrax, and in the next application, you, you know, oh, the adults may have already laid eggs, you know. So I might come in with in the carp in the next to effectively control that egg and larva. And that is how when we rotate these chemistries, we can widen the range of efficacy in controlling. And a lot of times farmers may say, this product is not effective, it's not effective because they're actually using, or they have been using one chemistry throughout the entire period of the crop and somehow complain about it not being effective. These insects have been around long before us and they are able to adapt very quickly to these chemistries. And that is why, again, we stick to best practices in turn as it relates to chemical rotation of active ingredients, not just the brand names. Continuing with our product lineup, we also have included adjuvants, products that can enhance the efficacy of the 
pesticides or chemistries. So exit, new film pee and breakthrough are three such products we have here at CCG that can do that. Exit and breakthrough are products that are able to pull the active ingredients through. So they create some form of translaminar effect. So once a product touches the surface of the plant, the leaves, stems, exit is able to pull those products, that, that, that active ingredient through the leaves to increase the efficacy. So let's say you had applied some caratrax when there were no larvae at the time, but the adults had laid the eggs and the eggs were there developing. When applied with exit, it is now able to pull the caratrax into the leaves and therefore when these larvas develop and start to eat those leaves, because the caratrax also is a contact and ingestion product, it is able to also help in the control of those pests. Mind you, those pests would have, those larvae would have been developed in the time frame of the efficacy of the Karachak's application. So exit is a methyl ester of fatty acids, essentially pine oil, very safe to use on our crops in conjunction with our chemistries. New film P, as I mentioned, oh, my bad. New film P is a panel in oil. It is a spreader sticker. What New film P does, it actually creates a film that is able to coat the active ingredient and protect that active ingredient from the degrading elements such as the UV light, rain. So it extends the efficacy of the active ingredient, essentially keeping the product alive for the pest to come and for a lack of a better word, for the pest to come and consume or pass through. So these products can greatly improve how these chemistries work. Breakthrough, another similar product to exit, however, this one is silicone based, and this one is also able to pull products through and improve the efficacy. So all in all, what we've tried to do with our control strategy is include chemistries that match the biology and feeding habit of the larvae and intertwine that now with adjuvants to extend the efficacy of those chemistries. So as I said before, it's no magic trick, it's just a manipulation of science and the chemistries that we have to give you the farmer or any user that stretch our better buck, bang for your buck, so to speak, because we always have to link a dollar value to the products we use. And if we can improve the efficacy of these products, then we certainly can save on how much you spend in controlling those pests of for the particular crop. Now the rates of these products are quite low and they are so, none of them have exceeded 10 milliliters or two teaspoons. And we have given you a range and this range again is dependent on the pest pressure. So in a case, we are trying to stick very close to IPM practice so we don't want to apply unnecessary pesticides. So in a case where the pest pressure is low, you can start from a half teaspoon, which is, is 2.5 ml, and as the pest pressure increases, you may go up to a teaspoon for car trucks. And the beauty about this product is that it has a very short pre-harvest intervals. So within two to three days of application, 
crops can be reaped after being sprayed the car tracks. And again, these products have also been chosen or can be positioned based on your particular situation in the field. So you have a crop that is ready to come to harvest. Over there are still some pests there that you want to control. This particular product culture is giving you that option. So you can control your pests and be sure that you can safely reap within a short time to produce a crop that is free from any residual pesticide. And that is very important. And I'm, I'm going to stress that point. It's very important. And it's, 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 it's also the responsible thing for farmers to note the pre-harvest interval of the pesticides they use so they can safely harvest crops to bring to market to the consume, to us the consumers, our consumers overall and end users so they can eat safe, healthy crops. So Cartrax offers that function, that, that, that range of pre-harvest interval. Indicar, also a very relatively low application rate. Uh, one teaspoon to two teaspoons, five to 10 ml. And again, is that rate is based on the pest pressure. However, this has a longer pre-harvest interval. And you'll also note that the positioning of the pesticides being used in your control strategy has to be linked <clears throat> to the harvesting of that particular crop. So you, the farmers, they need to know the time from planting to harvest so you can position the application of these particular pesticides so they don't... Hello? There's a question in the chat. Oh. What should be the frequency of the chemical rotation? Oh, no. We don't really like, or I personally really don't like to give a frequency because the frequency should be based upon all the other IPM practices that I've mentioned. In road, in scouting the field, you would be able to discern whether or not the pest pressure has been significantly dropped or dropped to a point that it is not affecting your harvest or crop damaging the crop. So we don't like to stick to an exact point. But however, a seven day rotation, a seven day rotation of pesticides is universally acceptable. So for car tracks, we make a seven day rotation of these pesticides in the event that the pest has not had had not, had not been significantly controlled, then you'll go on seven days. In some instances where the pest pressure is extremely high and the, the pests are damaging the crop, you might drop that to five day intervals. And as soon as you've broken the cycle to a point, you go back to the seven. I hope that I hope that answers the question. If not, you can ask me again. George, I can pick it up. Mimic, continuing mimic is a similar one to two teaspoons of 10 ml with a similar pre-harvest of seven to 14 days as well. So as usual, um, I hope um so far it has been clear for everyone and um, that you've seen how the strategy that we've employed at CCJ has to be linked to the biology of the particular pest that we are talking about. So worm, caterpillars, caterpillars, this is there. And now we have some field demonstrations that we've carried out. Neil? Uh, yes, hello. There's another question in the chat. Mm, go ahead. Are there any non-toxic chemicals that are effective? Non-toxic. Uh, that word, that word, that word needs to be put in a bracket. Toxic. Um, toxicity is relative, you know. 
because even even products that are deemed as biological or organic have to have some level of toxicity if they are to be effective against pests, whether that toxicity may be organic or inorganic. So that would be better, I think a better question would be maybe would have been, do we have any organic chemistries? However, um, as it relates to um, worm, caterpillar control at CCJ, we do not now have a organic control strategy, organic pesticide that is able to do so. We, we also have products that have some strains of that are able to control bacteria that are able to fungus that are able to control pests. But we didn't, I didn't include it in per se a worm strategy program. So we also have products that that do so, but we didn't include it in this particular worm strategy program. So to answer your quick question directly, for a control worm strategy program, no, we don't have an organic product to do so. Gail, but we another question. Let, let me just stretch to that, Georgia. Um, okay. However, Botanigard is a product that we do offer and it is able to do so because it's, as I mentioned before, Bavaria Bazana, it's a, it's a natural organism and it's able to control the pests. But it will be on the sideline as it relates to a control worm strategy. So we can look into botany guard. Yes, go ahead, Georgia. Question, how would you control cornea worms with these chemistries? Oh, I wanted these questions often. All right, because this, 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 um, I'd hold that question, Georgia. Hold that question until I reach this particular slide in the month so you can see. No Mm -hmm. All right, so we have here tomatoes being affected by actually cut worms, and we can see the holes advance after the worms do their damage, then they have secondary problems by fungus, fungal problems. I will see that they're extending. We went in. Oh, oh firstly, there was, this was the use of Inicar. Sorry about that. So it was two applications of Inicarp, and I use it at the higher rate because as we see, as you can see, the damage was advanced. So I went directly to the high rate to just to drop that pest pressure. So we had the tomatoes here being damaged. And then two weeks after the treatment, we saw us cleaning up, I continued, and then the blossoms were able to come up and at the four week mark, we saw there were no pests are very not at a significant level to affect the yield of the crop. We also went to Braco and we used car tracks along with exit. And this was in onion. And I included the exit because of the, 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 the nature of the onion leaves, the worms are lava oftentimes can hide inside the leaves. As you know, the leaves are cylindrical and have a hollow inside. So oftentimes the chemistries are unable to reach them inside. So exit, as I mentioned, can cause some translaminar effect and pull the product through, therefore reaching the worms on the inside. So we use the car tracks with the exit. I remember the car tracks can control the pest at all stages. So here we were, I wasn't seeing any moths when we saw the larva on the onions. So I said, oh, it's already there. So I went in with some exit, the car tracks and cleaned them up and allow them to grow. You know, you notice the tips are no longer brown like they were here. So you know, a lot of times you can observe the tips die back 
and oftentimes completely in off and just leave a, a gaping hole down into the leaf of the onion. So here now you can see the tips growing back because they have been cleaned up. And this is three weeks after the application of the card track with exit. For corn earworm, let me just delve it now that we, we reach. For the corn earworm, a similar approach can be taken with the car tracks or in the car. We mentioned you want something, and a lot oftentimes in the corn because it has a similar problem to the onion where the corn earworm can actually hide deep down. So you basically oftentimes wait till you see that damage and you see frost, worm frost on the corn then before you realize that worms are actually there. So you need to apply something like car shocks with the exit that you can reach the pest down. So you don't have to be bathing the pesticide or drenching the crop because we don't want that. We don't want you to be drenching the crop in an effort to try to get the pesticide down there. So that is what exit and breakthrough and new film P, those adjuvants are preventing. Improving efficacy of the chemistries without you having to drench or overly apply the product over the crop. So it's very important also to note that these adjuvants also do that. And again, by applying less, you're saving your money. And we're all about that here at Caribbean Chemicals. So here, this particular demonstration with cabbage, remember I was, I was alluding to cabbage, cabbage has been one of those problem crops. This was done in Bogol Clarendon. And in the carb along with exit was used. Again, you, you, if you notice, we keep on matching those adjuvants with the active ingredients to improve how they work or extend their efficacy. And cabbage is also one of those crops that as soon as the head starts to form and those inner leaves start to close, if the pest or the lava is inside, that means the diabond bat moth had already laid its egg there. We didn't see, you didn't see, you didn't observe that pest pressure at the time. And everything looked to be good and nice. And then you come back in two weeks' time. And it's like a gunman passed through your filter M16 because you're seeing pure holes through the leaves and everything. That's how they work. So including exit with the inner carb is trying to get that inner carb down into the inner leaves that have already started to fall where that larva or that egg was laid that has developed now into a larva that is eating their way or its way through coming up all through the newly formed head leaves. So if it is, if the pest is already in the inner leaf, every new layer of leaf that is formed, it will bite through because it is eating its way from the inside to the outside to now emerge as an adult moth to fly away. So once you have not effectively controlled diamondback moth larva at this stage, you cannot prevent the continued damage throughout the development of that, those cabbage heads because the larva is eating its way from the inside to the outside. And if we, if we quickly can go back to the stages of development, those are the different stages that it's going through as it eats its way to the surface and then fly away as a moth which is the adult diamondback moth that we wait to see before we say we have a problem. But if you are already seeing the moth, trust me, the problem is already very extensive. So the moth itself doesn't create any damage to the cabbage, but we know it that goes in the life cycle. Again, we have Cabbage again, Clarendon bug hole. And this, in this particular field demonstration, a rotation of the products were used. 
So remember I said, based on the feel, the pest pressure, it may be very high. And in this case, you can see it's an extensive area of being planted with cabbage. So you have monocropping. And then you may have an area that is known, which Bagol is known for its production of cabbage. So you can imagine the pest pressure in the, in, at times when this crop is in full production. So therefore, we employed in the car, car tracks and mimic in this particular rotation. And each of those chemistries are able, each of the chemistry is now able to work at a particular stage. So car tracks, because the farmer may have been seeing a lot of adult moths, he went through with car tracks, bam, trying to drop that adult population down. Mimic, because now the larvas are there, and we wanted to stop the larvas from feeding. We want to stop the damage, got the chewing up, chewing up on the cabbage. We want to stop that damage. Yes, in the carb, because it has that oversight or property included it with the exit. So you could get down into the farming heads to stop those that were already there from damaging the rest of the leaves to be formed. Very, very important that you are now able to see the strategy at work that we've spoken about out in the real world. So I have a question. I'm going to answer the current question, right, Georgia? Hopefully, I answer the current question. Yes, please, but I have another. There's another question in the chat before you ask your question. Um, so, but I'm going to ask Parker because he was answering it in the chat. Okay. Question. Oh, thank you, Dave. I'm going to come on. Um, the question is: You said earlier that adjuvant will prevent weather condition from washing off these chemicals used to control pests. Mm -hmm. My question is: Will the adjuvant cause chemical residue on your plants, and how can you prevent this? Okay. Parker said it's dependent on the method of application or spray mixture. So I'm going to ask him to elaborate. Okay. 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 Good. Yes. All right. Good I did. Afternoon, oh, oh, Parker, going to elaborate. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. Go, go yeah. ahead, Dean. Yeah, man. Afternoon. All right. So um, what I was indicating is that if depending on your spray okay. mixture as well as the type of nozzles you're doing. Remember, Dale was saying that if you're if you if you if you're applying it too heavily, or you're bathing the crop, then of course you will have extended residual action, as well as you'll have some amount of more more bonding to the surface of the plant leaves, which is gonna give you that. So you have to be mindful of that. Also, be mindful of the the your your your, your tank mix in terms of the combination of products that you're using. That too can um, extend your residue on 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 the crop itself. So. These are things you, are, you should be mindful of. Remember too that the different chemistries you have come with a pre-harvest interval. So, so you also need to be mindful. So if you're using like a contact product, say for example, a mancozeb, um, and you have two weeks to harvest, you know, then rather than going the high rate, say for example, 20 grams, you could step down to say 15 and still be effective in control and then be in a position to harvest within your two weeks span. So that's a strategy you can also employ in, in, in doing what you're doing. So just be mindful of your pre-harvest interval as well as your technique in terms of application. I hope that answers the question. Bill, back to you. Yeah, uh, and to, to add to, just to add to that, the adjuvants that we have at CCJ here, in themselves, when used correctly, have no or very little, should have very little toxicity or toxic effect on the plant. If you are having any problems with, in, as it relates to toxicity, that means you have used an incorrect amount. That means you have over applied or your mix rate or your rate was way too high. And if you know the rate of the, 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 the application rates are very low. 
So a lot of times because the application rate is low, farmers are tempted to up it because, oh gosh, the cabbage field full up here. Diamond back mat. No man, me, them said half a teaspoon, two fat. No, this too little bit, man. Show half a bottle. Now, if if the application rate or recommended application, application rate is 2.5 ml, which is a half teaspoon to five ml, which is one teaspoon, and you chose now to use two tablespoons or three tablespoons, then definitely we can vote for you having any toxicity. The manufacturer's recommendation needs to be followed as it relates to what is written on the labels. Once those have been, are followed and the best practices are used, there should be no toxicity involved. And this is in addition to what Dane has just mentioned about. Because there are different parameters now when speak about the tank mix and all of that. But in essence, when used in at current rate, there should be no toxicity. So if you are getting that, you have to backtrack and look at the rate that you applied and see what are we are in that step control strategy that you went wrong and then address that. Okay. My question now, Georgia. Or are there any other yes, questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. No more questions. All right. My question is easy as always, because you don't want to give away this stuff. You don't want to keep it. Um, name one defining feature that separates the Lepidopteran lava from the Coleopteran larva so name one defining feature in other words that can differentiate between a grub and a caterpillar so when you're out in the field digging spring when you see a caterpillar when you see a grub name one defining feature that can tell oh this is a this is a grub this is not a lepidopteran oh this is a caterpillar this is not a coleopteran Yes. Um. There's a there's the answer in the chat. Wow. Legs. May I get? Me think. May I go to um. Legs. Ah. Legs. Him get that. Who that? That person get the labeling. Uh, da, 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 da. I need <laughs> more. Le oh wow. Legs is very popular. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Wow. So I'm gonna. Steve is the first person who wrote leg. So I'm gonna ask Steve to send me the contact so I can reach out to that person. Uh, let's say legs. I, 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 I'm going to give it away, no, but by true, is there are pro legs, you know? Because it's not really, but uh, run with it. You know? Yes, the pro legs on the back, the, the, the abdominal, right, right, all right, work with that. The pro legs and the lepidopter and our caterpillar would differentiate from the grub, right? Grub has no prolet and the other one, right? Cool. So, as usual, um, we have ergonomists all over the island, the length and breadth of the island, and they can be contacted for any technical support. We also have information on our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, at carbchemjam.jam. So you can always go back and look on those past presentations or trainings that can help you with your crop production. And as usual, I want to thank everyone for joining in. It's always, a it's always a pleasure bringing information to the fore. And I like the fact that you have been very interactive by asking questions. So I hope it was a meaningful presentation and you learned something new and, and, and may now be able to form your personalized worm strategy that will improve your crop production. Once again, thank you for having me. And thank you very much, Dale. Thank you, Dean Parker, also.
Um, thanks to all the persons who joined today. Just want to remind you that our radio feature comes on tomorrow morning on Power 106 at 6.18 a.m. to 6.45. We ask you to join us tomorrow and every Wednesday. Also, next week, same time, the topic will be how to effectively control nematodes. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks. I'm asking Stevie to just send me a number at 876-401-4766. Thank you.